Well, in Psalms 24, um, on the screen, we're going to put 6 and 7, but I want to read a little bit more of that. It says, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. If there's anything I know about the Father, is he's looking for purity. He's looking for us to idolize him and him alone. For us to know that he's our God and we're his people. It's a covenant he made way back in the Old Testament with the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he wants that for us today too. That we will be the ones that carry him as a sanctuary in our heart. And it says in verse 5, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. And then he says, this is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors. When he says Jacob, he's making a statement that Jacob, he was identifying him that he was a man of blessing. He was a man that was living a righteous life, and he was a man that was in God's covenant. You are my God, and I am your people. And then he goes on to talk about the generations. And he said, those, uh, this is the generation of those who seek him, the blessed ones, the righteous ones. But they do more than just say, I'm in covenant relationship with you. Because we can give our lives to Christ and say we're in covenant relationship and then go living our day in sin or go living our day in the world and just saying, I'm a professed Christian, but I'm not living the way that I said I was in covenant with the Lord. And it means something to God. It really means something to him. And this is the difference between the generations of those who seek him is they also pursue him continually. There's a pursuit that takes place. And you know what happens when we do that, friends, as a congregation, as individuals? What happens is the king of glory comes. I love that. The king of glory comes. It says, lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come. When we stand in this place and we worship the Lord and we extend our hands to him, you're that gate. You're that gate that is submitting yourself to the Lord to invite the presence of God, the very tangible presence of God into this house. Isn't that beautiful that we have the ability to do that? And he wants to come. He longs to come. And I have three PowerPoints that I want to give you. This is three biblical connections to the idea that the king of glory shall come. Old Testament and for the new, for us today. And the first one is this will be fulfilled or was fulfilled when the Ark of the Covenant came to Jerusalem. I have some scriptures to back that up. I want you to take a picture of it. If we can put that on the screen. It is. Okay. Um, you can study that later. I don't want to go into it because of the uh, sake of time. So when the Ark of the Covenant came in, that was fulfilled. The King of Glory came, right? Two, second PowerPoint, this was fulfilled when the ascended Jesus entered into heaven. Acts 1, 9 through 10 and Ephesians 1, 20. And this is fulfilled in our day. When an individual opens his heart to Jesus Christ, the King of glory. The Bible says in James 4, 8, draw near to me, right? And I will draw near to you. There is a longing for God to see the body of Christ draw near to him. More than ever before, a longing, a passionate longing to be with us. And I believe that we are in a divine intersection for the church today. And God is asking us, he's challenging us. Are we going to host the presence of God or are we going to host man's agenda? And I'm not saying the agendas of church, the programs in church are good. They're very valid. We need to disciple people. But first and foremost, it must be the presence of God. How are we going to thrive without his presence? And I believe the church is being rebuilt today. I believe he's bringing back the tabernacle of David. I believe that he's calling the true worshipers that will run to the altar and worship him with everything that they have. 
God is drawing the hearts of his people back to him. That's what's happening in our day. And I think about the scripture in Matthew 16. I didn't give you this, Walt, but where God was talking to Peter, and he said to Peter, uh, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, or the gates of hell, shall not prevail against it. He said, I will build it. Well, if he's going to build it, doesn't he have to be present? (laughs) He has to be present, right? The churches cannot continue to rely on our own abilities. The Lord will build the house. The Lord must build the house. God is looking for a people that will surrender their pride, surrender their glory, surrender their crown, and give it to the one who deserves all the glory, the Godhead. Amen? Because he is the Alpha. He is the Omega. He is the Master Builder. And God desires is for his people who will worship his son. I want you to hear this. His desire is for you and I to worship the one who gave his life for us. He wants us to behold the lamb of God because he is the substance that we build on. It's Jesus, amen? You know, you think about what uh, God said in Exodus 25, 8, if we could put that on the screen. God instructs Moses, he said, hey, Build them a sanctuary that I might dwell among them. It was a longing in his heart in the very beginning. God's heart was longing to be with his people. He's longing to be with us. God loves the bride of Christ. In fact, the Bible says that he is a jealous God. He's jealous for us. And his greatest desire is to be worshipped. And if you look at the scripture in Exodus 34, 14, He says, for you shall worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. He wants to come, and he wants to dwell, and he wants to be present with us. That must be our desire as well. I know I always have these really not-so-fun messages, but I feel like it's a now word. God kept me up all night for this word. Because I think that's his desire for this house. He wants to rest in this place so we can do great exploits for him. David understood the longing of God's heart because he made God the sanctuary of his heart. It was a real thing to him. It was a tangible thing to him. He relied on the presence of God. In Psalm 63, 2 and 4, look what he said. This is David, the man after God's own heart, he says. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power, your glory, because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips will praise you. Thus, I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. That's why when we come to worship, man, my hands are raised. (laughs) I'm going to lift up my hands to Jesus. I'm going to expose my love to him in every way that I can. It's a beautiful thing. It's a great connection. And my heart's desire is that people in this church and other churches will be abandoned. And when the burning bush happens, just like Moses, the burning bush happened, he looked aside. He got God's attention. My heart is that the church and the body of Christ will start to burn for Jesus again. You know, David understood what the sanctuary was. The people back then, they knew there was multiple reasons why they had the sanctuary. The sanctuary was a place where people could come and they could meet the Lord face to face and get answers to their problems that they were facing at the time. How many of you know God God wants us to minister, right? He wants us to do that. David, he even came to the sanctuary for advice. He came to the sanctuary for insurance. He came to the sanctuary for help, for direction. Why? Because he knew the sanctuary was a place where God lived. His presence dwells in the sanctuary when we allow it in fact in psalms 84 1 and 2 psalms 84 1 and 2 it says how lovely this is david speaking how lovely is your tabernacle o lord of hosts my soul longs yes even faints for the court of the lord my heart and my flesh cry out for the living god I don't want to go to a church that's just dead. I've been to so many churches, and I don't even feel Jesus showed up for the service. I want a living, alive, and active God like the Bible says. 
How many of us have a heart cry for the living God to rest in our local churches, in our homes, in our families, in our city, in our nation? I was so excited about prayer time Friday because when, we, when I first got here, it was like hardly nobody here. I'm like, God, bring the hunger, bring the hunger, bring the hunger. And people were here, and they were raising their hands, and there was prophetic words released, and there was a hunger, and I felt like there was a shift in the spirit. And I believe there is, that God is moving. He's going to start moving even more. The more we petition him, the more we say, open up the gates and let the king of glory come in. Let me tell you, he will come. David knew the importance of this. He knew the importance of God being present in his everyday life. In fact, in Psalms 8410, you can open your Bibles or read the screen. 8410, he said this, for one day in your courts is better than a thousand. One day in your courts. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. That word doorkeeper means standing at the door. And let me tell you, there's a big contrast be, from being outside the, on the edge of God's house than being inside the house of the wicked. Come on. You're either in the world or inside the presence of God, out of the world, right? And David knew this because among the jobs of the Levites, they were the keepers of the threshold. That was one of their job duties, and it was considered one of the lowest of lowest job duties. You know why? Because they believed that the closer you were to the door, or to the holy of holies, past the door, the more important your job seemed to be. But David, he said, I don't care. I'd rather take the one lowliest job, the lowliest of lowliest job, guarding the entrance of the door, than fellowship and enjoy being in the comfort of being inside the house of the wicked. Come on. How many people today are running to the church looking for hope because they can't handle what the world has to offer. I just got a phone call or a text from a friend, somebody I know from many years ago, and says, when's your church service? She goes, we need God. I, my kids need to come to church. She'll probably be here the second one. She goes, I need to get him in there because the world is robbing us of our destiny. He's taking our kids, the enemy's taking our kids and robbing them of our destiny. That's why I'm so excited that we have youth camp coming up. It's going to be awesome for them. They're going to come back so ablaze. You guys better get ready and start getting in your word because they're going to, they're going to catch up and move forward. <laughs> okay? The more people are come, that are coming to the house of God, why? Because they want their hearts refreshed. They want an awakening. They want hope. They want to know that God still moves in their life. God can still move in their lives today. You know what? I didn't even know that God could move in my, the beginning of my walk. Most of you know I got saved when I was eight years old at vacation Bible school. Then, you know, I went five days, but never, my mom and dad never took me to church after that. But my grandma was a devout Catholic, and she started to teach me about the Catholic religion. At least it was something. I got to, you know, do the rosary, all those things, so I experienced all that. Then when I got older, I started going to a Calvary Chapel-based church, which was great. They gave you all the fundamentals of Scripture, and you get grounded in it and everything. And then me and my husband, we served in the Calvary Chapel uh, based church for eight years doing children's ministry and we loved it but we got a phone call one day from my aunt and she said Linda you need to come to Brownsville Pensacola there's revival happening there she said it's it's a revival of the spirit of repentance is being released and the call to holiness and I was like, oh my gosh, because we were never taught about that. We were reading the book by Hank Hanegraaff that says it's about counterfeit revival. We were like, wait a minute, because it said in that book there's going to be people that are barking like dogs, rolling on the floor, holy rollers, twitching and jerking and all this other stuff. And we were like, oh my gosh, we got to go to Brownsville, Pensacola, and we got to go save my aunt. She's in a cult. <laughs> That's what we thought. It's really what we thought. And so we packed up our bags and we went to Florida. And when we went there, it was amazing because you left her house. She was like an hour and a half to get to Pensacola, to where the church was. And we left at 5.30 in the morning to get to a service that was at 6 o'clock at night. I'm like, why are we driving an hour and a half to go to a service at 6 o'clock at night? And I found out real quick when we got there, there was people, blocks and blocks and blocks in line to go to 
a six o'clock service at night. Some would show up at the dawn of day. Some spent the night. There was people that were sitting around hibachis cooking hot dogs. People surrounded in, in circles praying and worshiping. There was a couple of people that had guitars just singing out songs of worship to the Lord. It was amazing. And me and my husband, we were so excited for that part, but we we're like, okay, uh, we haven't seen nothing strange yet. So we started walking, it got close to the time, and we started walking up to the, um, the steps, and I remember getting on the steps and my knees started to buckle. I was like, oh my God. It was the Shekinah Kabod, the glory, the Shekinah glory of God. I felt the heavy weight of God. I never felt that before. I felt his presence, but not to where it buckled my knees. And I remember we went in there, and it was amazing. Worship was like two, three hours. Like people, it didn't feel like it was that long. The angels, I felt like the angels joined us in worship. And during worship, people were going in groves, waves after wave after wave of people running up to the altar, giving their lives to Christ. All the message that, messages that were taught were about sin, about overcoming sin, about giving your life to Jesus, about repentance. It was beautiful. Beautiful. John Kilpatrick, he was the pastor of that church, and he's decided in his heart that in 1993 that he said, I'm going to start praying for revival, and I want every one of my leaders to start praying for revival. We needed an awakening. For two years, praying and praying and praying for God's wind to come and blow through that church, and in 1995, June 18th, on Father's Day, the wind of God came and blew the doors wide open, and there was revival for five years, over two million people came through that church. Thousands and thousands of people healed, tumors falling off. It was amazing. It was an amazing experience for us. But when we first got there, we were such skeptic, skeptics. I didn't like people twitching, and I, didn't, I seen different things that were happening, people falling out. We never experienced that. But my husband, the man of the word that he is, he says, well, I'm going to judge this by the word of God. Are they speaking sound doctrine? Are they giving the word of God? Because that's what's really important. And they were. And uh, the fifth day, yeah, the fifth day we were there. This is my interpretation. My husband has a whole other one too, but this is what I experienced. The last day we were up in the balcony and I was seeing people falling out and I'm still kind of critical about that. My husband says, you know what? The presence of God is here. The word of God is sound. Let's go up to the altars and get prayer. And if this is from God, he's going to let us know. We went up to the altars for prayer. Before that, I was mocking a girl who got prayed for. And she was like jerking. Because when the presence of God manifests himself on you, your body sometimes doesn't know how to handle it. And people will judge it sometimes. And I was the worst critic at the time. I'm like, you know, I was defending God. <laughs> but really, I didn't understand that God move, was moving. And I went up to the altar uh, to go get prayer. The lady touched me. I went down. I thought I went right back up. But my aunt said, you were down for like 25 minutes. <laughs> and I got back up. And you know what? I was jerking all over. I didn't even know it. My aunt comes running down from the top of the building. She goes, ha, ha, ha. You're doing the same thing she's doing. I go, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. Oh, my God, I am. But let me tell you, after that five-day experience at Brownsville Revival, our lives changed. Because even though we were in the church, there were things that weren't right. We stopped watching our movies. I started to change the way I dressed. We didn't do the things that grieved God's spirit because we wanted God to move. And when we went back to our church, it was so weird because we saw it. We could see. We could see that God wasn't moving in the church. I mean, I didn't even know that I could have a prayer language. I wasn't even taught about that. I didn't know that signs, miracles, and wonders for, were for today and that Holy Spirit moves. When we usher in the presence of God, the hardest of hearts will be changed. Let me tell you. Come on, give the Lord a great big hand. Some of us have been so sheltered in our Christian walk and with the local churches that we don't even understand the reality that God actually moves today. He does. I, I've been reading this book. I got it on my... Um, app on my phone. I've been reading it. And I ordered the book because I was like, so like, this is amazing. And it talks about the old revivals and the revivals to come. You know, this guy, he's dead now, but he's gone with the Lord. But uh, 
is a great book. It's called In the Day, In Thy Day of Thy Power. And his name is Arthur Wallace, and he said this. He said, revival is divine intervention in the normal course of spiritual things. Wow. It is God revealing himself to man in awful holiness, irresistible power. It is such a manifest working of God that human personalities are overshadowed and human progress abandoned. It is man retiring in the background because God has taken the field. It is the Lord making bare his holy arm to work an extraordinary power on saints and sinners. Is that powerful? we got to step aside, man, and let God do the job he's called to, he wants to do. There is a glory, I believe, that's coming to the church that's going to silence the efforts of man. That's going to silence man's agenda. Not that it's not good, the programs and all that. I just said that before. But Holy Spirit wants to be the forerunner. And it's about, the church has never been about just filling the, the place with numbers, with people, with men. It was about filling it with the Holy Spirit so men can be filled with the Holy Spirit, with the revelation of God. That's what the church is for. And I believe God is awakening the churches to build differently. I, I want to be that person that builds differently. Because he's the master builder, not me, not Pastor Frank. He is. And I was listening to a teaching, uh, not a teaching, it was actually a talk show. I'm sorry, I'm kind of running a little bit late. <laughs> a talk show, are we okay with this? I'm so sorry. Okay, I was listening to a talk show, um, uh, an interview actually with Michael Kulianis. And they said, how do you host the glory so well? He said, we teach our people to value his presence. He says, we birth that in our sanctuary. We birth valuing him, being present, not being distracted, knowing how holy the moments are. It's beautiful. We can't depend on our own abilities as pastors, as leaders, as servants of the Lord, followers of the Lord, as, even as mom and dads. The only thing we can depend on is him. It's him alone. We must put him first. We, might, we must prioritize his presence. We must build a holy sanctuary within our hearts for worship. When we gather together as brothers and sisters at the bride of Christ and we worship him, I promise you he will come. He will come. Michael Miller, he's a, a man that does the, he's a pastor of the upper room in Texas, Texas, Dallas, Texas. And he wrote this book, His House, His Presence. We went there one time. It's beautiful. He's a great speaker. You look him up listen to some of his teachings but he said in this book he said we cannot settle for the omnipresence of God I love the I know God's with us he said he'll never leave us and never forsake us when two or more are gathered he's in our midst right but he also said we need the manifest presence of God as well the power of God A.W. Towser same guy in uh, he said not same guy it's A.W. Towser sorry this is Arthur Willis hello <laughs> anyway, he said, the presence and the manifestation of the presence are not the same. They're not the same. There can be one without the other. God is here when we are totally unaware of it. He is manifest when we are aware of his presence. <laughs> Moses, the burning bush, he's present. But when he manifests that bush was burning, he turned aside and he noticed. Are you hearing me, friends? My desire is to see the local churches burn, to see God move. And his presence must be priority. It must be. We as a church have a decision we have to make. Whether we're going to be a people of his promise or a people of his presence. Because we can come to receive all the goods, all the food, all the programs. Me, 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 I, I, I. But can't, we can't leave him out. He has to be first. And I think about Moses Moses had to make a decision in his walk uh, with God, and he had to choose promise over presence. Go to Exodus 33, 1 through 3. This is here where um, we know that Moses was taking the Israelites out of Egypt, out of slavery. That was his mandate that God had for him. And he was about to leave the, uh, lead them into the promised land. And he was in Sinai, and God said, hey, you know, it's time to leave. It's time 
to go fulfill the promise after 40 years of wandering, after 40 years of wanting, after 40 years of waiting, it's now time to go. And, and Moses has this conversation with, with God in Exodus 33, 1 through 3. Let's read this. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Depart and go from here, and you, the people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, and Jacob saying to your descendants, I will give it. So he swore. He's, he's confirming the promise that he gave. Uh, he's telling Moses, I'm confirming this promise I gave to your forefathers, right? Verse 2, he says, and I will send my angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Parasites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. In other words, he's going to fight the battle for him. He's going to send the angel to fight the battle for him. He says, go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. For I will not go up in your midst. What? Lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked generation. Why is God saying they're a stiff-necked people? He says that throughout the Bible and when, with the Israelites, there's a couple times he's called them a stiff-necked generation, a stiff-necked people. But if you look back in chapter 32, I, in, in 32, I investigated this a little bit. We see where Moses, he, he went up to the mountain, and he went up to the mountain all the time to go see God. But this one particular time, there was a delay in him coming back. And the people were getting so anxious, and they're like, where is Moses? And they didn't know what happened to him, so they started to take everything into their own hands. They go to Aaron, they say, hey, listen, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take the golden earrings, we're going to take them from the wives, the sons, and the daughters, and we're going to take this engraving tool, and we're going to mold this golden earrings into a golden calf they wanted something else to worship because god wasn't present because moses didn't come down from the mountain and you know what they did they lifted up this golden calf and they said this is our god oh he was appalled by this God was so angry with them, it, them indulge, indulging in idolatry, indulging in the things of this world after everything that he had did. Where was their loyalty? Stiff-necked people, they're, they're people that are obstinate and difficult to lead. He was describing their attitude, and they understood when Jesus said that they were, uh, God said that they were a stiff-necked generation or a stiff-necked people. They got the message because they understand how farmers were. Farmers, when they had the ox to plow the field, they'd put the harness on the ox, and that ox was so stubborn, it didn't want to turn to the right, it didn't want to turn to the left, it didn't want to go fast, and they would take this little poking uh, tool, and they'd poke the heels of the ox and the heels of of uh, the neck of the um, ox to get him to do what they wanted him to do. And God was saying, they're a stiff-necked generation. So they got the message when he said that. God was so outraged that he wanted to consume them at that very moment. But I love Moses because Moses, he's, he's pleading with God to turn from his wrath, you know. He has God's best interest at heart. He said, turn from your wrath towards these people and, and remember your promise that you gave to your forefathers of faith, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember God. God, God was so furious that he, he didn't want to do that. He said, remember, you don't want the Egyptians saying, oh, he brought them out of harm to kill them in the, in the mountains. God. You swore this. This was, a, this was a promise. But God was so fierce with them, that's why he said in verse 3, Exodus 33, 3, I'm going to read it again. He said, go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. And Moses is like, wait a minute, God. I really I thank you that you heard my heart cry. Thank you that you're not going to consume them, but you're telling me you're not going to go with this? to the promised land? Moses is like, wait a minute, we got to have a conversation. And so what does Moses do? He goes and he gets his tent. It's a mobile tent that they, he would have in the wilderness. And he went and he pitched his tent. And by the way, he pitched, his, pitched it so far away from the Israelites because of the defilement that they caused by this golden calf. And he pitched this tent and he went into this tent and he had a conversation with God. And this is what took place. Exodus 33, 9 through 15. And it came to pass when, when Moses entered the tabernacle that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. The pillar of cloud was the presence of God. And the Lord talked with Moses. All the people saw the pillar of cloud standing in the tabernacle door, and all the people rose and worshiped, each man in his tent door. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend, and he would return to the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, 
a young man did not apart, depart from the tabernacle because he was just like, I'm in the presence of God, right? Then Moses said to the Lord, see, you say to me, bring up these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. But he did. He said, I'm going to send an angel with you to take care of it all. And he says to him, yet you have said, I know you by name. And you have also found grace in my sight. What about our relationship, God? Now, therefore, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight. And consider that this nation is your people. God heard his heart cry. And God responded to Moses because of that heart cry. And he said in verse 14, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And then he said to him, God, do you mean it? Because if your presence does not go, do not bring us up from this place, from here. God gave Moses some options. He's saying, he's saying, I'll send the angel before you, and that angel is going to fight for you and wipe out all your enemies. You're going to have guaranteed success. You're going to have guaranteed victory. You can go for your promised land, but my, prom my presence will not go with you. So Moses had a decision he had to make. Was he going to choose the promise, or was he going to choose the presence? How many of us struggle with decisions? I know when my husband takes me out to dinner and I have to choose between the cheesecake and the chocolate cake, I'm like, eh, eh, eh. which one do I want? And my grandkids, I take them to Five Below sometimes and they have this little cart that they walk around with and I, let, I say, you know, depending on how many kids I got because it's $5 a piece for a gift, my grandkids will go and they'll get stuff. I say, okay, you can have two, two things, each of you two things and they'll go and they got like five, six things in their cart. And I'm like, you have to make a decision here. And they're struggling like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. I go, well, look at it and say, what is a good thing and what is not such a good thing? What do you desire most? What do you not desire most? And uh, my little Gracie says, well, here's, there's slime, and, and there's silly putty. I really want these, but I know my mom doesn't like me having it because it gets on my couch, it gets in my hair, it gets on the floor, and she's struggling with this decision, but she made the right one. She said, you know what? My mom said, no, I'm going to sacrifice that and put it up here and take what I'm allowed to do. She made the right choice. Say amen. Amen, right? But Moses wasn't like that. Moses didn't, he didn't hesitate at all. He didn't hesitate all, at all. He said, if your promise doesn't go with me, I'm not going. It doesn't matter to me, God, that you're sending an angel. It doesn't matter to me that I have a guarantee. It doesn't matter to me that I don't have to draw my sword. It doesn't matter to me that I don't have to draw, uh, fight the fight, that you're going to fight it for me. I don't want the angel. I don't want the promise without your presence. Come on. Just like Moses, if I could get the worship team to come up, we need to make a decision for our lives and how we play church. I always have messages that are so hard. I'm, I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry because I want his presence here more than anything. I don't want to do life without it. We must redefine what the church looks like. Is the church's success fueled with people and programs, or is it fueled with his presence? Because I promise you, if it's fueled with its presence, everything else shall be added unto it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else will follow. Please stand in this house, and if we can dim the lights. John Abbott, he said this. He said, revival in our day? Why not? The same yesterday, today, and forever. God still loves his church. He still moves and brings new life. And he said this, he said, I've asked him lately in my quiet time with him, Lord, why has revival been so rare in the recent dead gaze in America? And I, he said, I heard the whisper of the Lord say to me, my people have exactly what they want. And when they want more, they're going to have it. We have not because we ask not. I want the fire of God. I want the church to be healed and whole. I want my prodigals coming home. And we have to cry out to the Lord, Lord,
put revival in me. Let it begin in me. Let the awakening start in me. Amen. If you want an awakening and you want to cry out to the Lord and say, God, let revival begin in me, I want you to run to these altars.